to try to catch my breath. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight, the Lord willing, we're looking at verses 5 through 9 of chapter 17. Turning the world upside down. And as you and I face our world today, the question is, are we turning our world upside down, or are we simply being turned upside down by our world? And it seems like in many cases, that is what's happening to the body of Christ. The world is turning us upside down, shaking us to get all the change out of our pockets, and then throwing us away. Acts chapter 17, tonight we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9. Uh, we'll read first verses 1 through 4, which gives us the context that we're looking at for tonight. So Acts chapter 17, and I'll begin re reading in verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we look the world around us, we recognize that there will oftentimes come false accusations based on the claims and the claims that are true of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet the world doesn't want to admit that. The world is insistent that they are in charge and not Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will help us to winsomely and wisely carry the good news of Jesus Christ to people who are lost regardless of how they respond. Our job is to obey, not to have success. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings tonight on your word as it goes forth, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you remember last week we did sort of a historical background study on what was happening here in this passage as Paul continues on his missionary journey. We noted that Paul was clearly being led by the Spirit of God. God has been directing every step of this path. When they tried to go the wrong way, God makes sure that they didn't. They tried to go uh, east instead of going west, and God stopped them. They tried to go north instead of south, and God stopped them. God made it clear by what we call the Macedonian call that they were to head over into Macedonia, and that's where they went. We saw, secondly, as we looked at this, that uh, the message that Paul preached was exactly the same regardless of where he went. The message was the gospel of Christ. The good news that Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So as we see the response tonight in this passage of scripture, it's not because Paul has changed his message. The same message presented to different groups of people, and we'll see some very interesting similarities between groups that responded in a totally different way tonight, but the same message will produce a different response in the hearts of people based on very one very key issue that we see both in our text tonight and in several other passages where Paul has been preaching the gospel. We'll get to that, the Lord willing, in a few minutes. We saw that God told them to go around uh, go, excuse me, go through certain villages not to go around them. God told them not to stop there, but he worked out the timing so that they would stop in exactly the right place because it would be on the Sabbath day, and Paul knew the Jews would gather together in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, so God worked it out, the precise timing of where they were. And the same thing is true of us when we are living our lives in the world around us, 
nothing happens by accident. God works out the precise timing for us to be in contact with a certain individual or a certain group of people. The question is, are we taking advantage of what God has given to us? Do we take advantage of that opportunity to share Christ? Paul always did. He followed God very clearly. He followed the direction that Christ was giving to him. He made sure that he was walking in the Spirit. And then when the opportunity arose, he took advantage of it. Don't expect a better opportunity to come at a later date. It may not. You may die. That other person may die. You may never see them again. God may work in your life in such a way that uh, something happens in our country. And you know, I was reading some very interesting things today that uh, indicate that Russia has, you know, within the last few days, has closed down uh, the entire gas supply to Ukraine and to all the companies, countries, excuse me, through Ukraine that are receiving their gas all over Europe. Russia is cutting things off. Russia has uh, dest destabilized the euro because they have gone off the euro standard. Uh, they are putting a real strong economic crunch on the rest of the world right now, especially on Europe right now. We may be facing World War III very soon. Folks, if that happens, opportunities that you thought you were going to get again are not going to happen. You say, well, you know, I was going to witness to that person, but, but it just really didn't seem appropriate at this time. You don't know, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we are on the brink of world collapse in many different areas. Economic is one of them, and that's the kind of thing that brings wars on. Paul took advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God made him go through certain places, but God made him stop at other places. He passed through, not around, Apollonia, but he didn't stop until he reached Thessalonica. And as we noted, God never includes details in Scripture that are not important. We've been learning that very definitely in the morning worship services where we've been looking at genealogies. God includes details because he puts them there for a purpose for us. It's given to us for edification. It's given to us for comfort. It's given to us for the purposes that God has, doctrine, correction, reproof, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. God planned the timing to bring them to Thessalonica on the Sabbath day. And as you know, from what we've studied before, God made them stop at certain places because those were places that were going to have specific types of problems that he was going to address later in his epistles so that it covers the entire scope of all possible church problems. And so God had him stop at Thessalonica and two letters were going to get written to that city at a later date. We noted that God had already put a large Jewish population in Thessalonica. God put a population of Jews there that had already established a synagogue. That's different than what we saw at Philippi. Because at Philippi, it was a Jewish women's prayer group by the river. So we find him returning to the same strategy that's used throughout the rest of the book of Acts. He goes first to the synagogue. He lays a foundation. Because by doing that, he's able to then send new converts back to a, an established group. We talked about Thessalonica. We talked about its location on the uh, Appian Way. We talked about the location of the other cities. We saw that uh, there were some very special things about that city in terms of its ability to reach different corners of the empire. We find that Paul went and reasoned with them on three Sabbath days in a row. He was very careful in the way that he laid his foundation. And then he sprang the trap, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Magnificent. We talked about what the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 7, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It has four basic elements under two major headings. The two headings are the person of Christ, the work of Christ. The elements under the person of Christ is he's both God and man. We talked about his deity last week in the morning worship. We talked about his humanity this week and the importance of it as expressed in the genealogies. Who Jesus is. That is, he's both God and he's man. The second major heading is what Jesus did. 
That has two elements also. He died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. And Paul tells us that's the gospel by which we are saved. And he ties it all together because he says, according to the scriptures. It has to be based on the scriptures. It has to be the Christ of scriptures. It cannot be the Christ of Jehovah's Witnesses. It cannot be the Christ of the Buddhists. It cannot be the Christ of the Hindus. They put up pictures of Jesus too. You know, one of their 330 million gods. Uh, it has to be the Christ of the scriptures because no other Christ can save you. We notice that in that situation, apparently some Hellenized Jewish women responded and um, it tells us there were three Greek, uh, three groups there there were some of them those are the men in the synagogue he's been preaching in the synagogue so he says some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks those are Gentiles who have become God-fearers not a, a great multitude and of the chief women so here's your third group those would be the Hellenized Jewish women not a few and we saw that women are often more open to spiritual things and thus more receptive to the gospel or they are more antagonistic like the demon-possessed woman that they had just run into in Philippi at the last place God had had them stop. What a contrast. The demon-possessed woman, the women's prayer group. Now we find here there are some chief women in the city and we find that there are Gentiles and we find that there are Jewish men. It tells us in Acts 17, too, Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Now that's what's immediately in the text that precedes our text for tonight. Verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Interesting. These are guys who claim to be quite righteous, claim to be quite honorable. Uh, after all, they're the bastion of God's truth in this city. They're the ones who come to synagogue every week. You know, just being in church doesn't make you a Christian. Just like them being at synagogue didn't really make them sons of Abraham. They're the ones who oppose the message that Paul's bringing. But it's interesting that they don't oppose the message just directly by themselves they hire thugs now stop and think about this now one of our elders who's here don't 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 listen to what I'm about to say here can you imagine your elder board going out and hiring a bunch of mafia guys to beat up a visiting preacher that's what's happening in this text here it says they took on themselves certain lewd fellows of the baser sort they went out and got a bunch of thugs. They went down to the local bar. They dragged some guys out and said, look, we'll give you a couple of bucks if you'll help us start a riot. And the guy said, sure, we'll be happy to do that. That's fun kind of stuff to do. They've had that kind of people around for a long time, folks. They took in themselves certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company. So, you know, if you're going to start a riot, you got to get some people together. One guy standing in the street and throwing rocks is not a riot and all they'll do is they come lock him up and put him away as a as a nutcase they got a bunch of people you know as you read this it strikes me very much as the type of thing that happened with the communist sympathizers back in the uh, sympath uh, 60s and early 70s uh, where they were causing riots on college campuses it strikes me very much the same way as the different groups that have been running around with signs both in this country and especially in Great Britain and some places in Europe you know rioting over the Jews and over the Palestinian situation and uh, rioting over you know someone who said something that they took as being offensive to the Prophet Muhammad so it's happening here they said we don't like the message that those other guys are bringing so we will intimidate them have you ever been intimidated? Or has anybody ever tried to intimidate you? That's what's going on here in this passage. They're going to make sure that the Apostle Paul gets the message. They gathered a company and they set all the city on an uproar. So like a, a gay pride parade here, except as the gay pride parade goes down the street, they're screaming and yelling and throwing rocks and breaking windows and carrying on and the whole city gets into an uproar. What's going on? You know how bad these guys are? You gotta come and help us. We gotta get rid of them. They're in town. 
and they assaulted the house of Jason. Oh, so they knew where Paul was staying. It's, it's sort of like the old um, joke about the mafia. We know where you live. <laughs> Folks, they know where we live. The people who hate Christ know where you live. It says they assaulted the house of Jason. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Jason, except for the fact that, can you imagine, suppose you live, think about where your house is located, and suddenly a group of maybe a thousand people come and surround your house. It says they assaulted the house of Jason. They didn't just stand outside and yell. They assaulted it. They were there banging on the doors. They were there smashing in. They didn't have windows like we've got now, but they had those slap shutter kind of things. Uh, smashing those things open, trying to rip them up. And so Jason finally comes out. Imagine your neighborhood. Your neighbors are all hiding inside the house. They know who you are, but they're not going to admit it with a group like this coming around. They assaulted the house of Jason. They drew him out of the house. You know, I don't think they said, Jason, would you mind coming out? Uh, here, I'll hold your hand gently and we'll tiptoe through the tulips until we get outside. It says they drew him out. I mean, they smashed down the door. They grabbed this guy by the throat. They dragged him out. His feet were probably dragging behind. He probably thought to himself, you know, I'm the next one to die. They drew out Jason and certain brethren. Oh, so Jason had a bunch of other Christians at his house. Can you imagine you're sitting down to a meal and suddenly somebody breaks down the door of your house and not only pulls you out, but all of your guests too. You think your guests would be interested in coming back for dinner the next week? <laughs> Folks, you know, we read through these texts and it's like, yeah, all sterile and dry and cut and paste and, you know, you don't think what's going on, but put it in the context of, you know, our day and age and a whole group marching through Collingswood and as they come through Collingswood toward this church the group is beginning to grow and we hear them coming down the, the driveway here and they see lights on here so suddenly rocks and bricks are coming through the window here and people are sticking their heads in and yelling and screaming and some people are climbing in and you try to run out the door and there are people who have broken down the door there and they are coming down the hall along here and they are grabbing you and they are dragging you outside and they are dragging you down to town hall which is not a friend of us here and they are yelling and screaming and accusing you of all kinds of different things and beating you up as you go. Folks, that's what was happening in the early church. That may be what happens with us someday here. We don't think it can happen, huh? It's happened all over the world. It's happened to many Christians in cultures where they thought they were safe and they weren't. And you know why it happened? For one reason the gospel of Christ. Paul had been preaching the gospel of Christ. He opened an alleged that Christ had to die for our sins, be buried, and rise again from the dead. And that was changing people's lives, and the culture around them didn't like it. And the religious people around them didn't like it. And the people who saw that they were losing influence didn't like it. When the gospel of Christ affects a person's life, it changes his life and the other people don't like it. A drunk gets saved and the bartender's not very happy about that. One drunk got saved because he no longer comes to the bar. But if every client in the bar got saved and no longer came to the bar, the bartender would be upset about it. And suppose that was happening all over society in all kinds of different jobs and locations and people were insisting that they were going to worship in church on Sunday instead of work for their employer on Sunday and do all the things that, you know, it would cause a racket in society, wouldn't it? That's what happened. And it happened fast. Paul was only there three weeks. He was only preaching for three weeks. But it says, a great company. It made an Im incredible impact on that town. And you know, it was also affecting some very important people. It was infecting, affecting the honorable women. The women with influence. Women who had influence to influence their husbands, some of whom were probably on town councils. That's the way it had worked in Philippi. 
there were honorable women there. That's where it worked in other places, there were honorable women. We'll look at some of those passages in a minute. And the men decided, we don't believe that message, and we're not going to put up with it anymore. We're going to do something about it. Hey, there's not enough of us to do something about it. Let's go hire some thugs. And that's what they did. That's what's happening in our text here tonight. Let us listen to what they, they screamed. It says they were crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Haven't you guys heard about it? Do you know what happened at those other cities where these fellows came? Why, they just completely destroyed the society. Now look, when Christians come to town, do they destroy society? Well, they might destroy some sinful things. You know, the gospel of Christ does change people's lives. Things do turn around. Laws do get changed. When people get saved, suddenly there's a, a different aura about a society. But wicked people don't like it. The way they view it is the world has been turned upside down. You see, they're so used to living in an upside down world that when you turn the world right side up, they can't tolerate it. They've come hither also, whom Jason hath received. That's a, that's a pretty heavy charge, isn't it? You know what? He exercised hospitality. He exercised hospitality to those bad guys. Are we supposed to exercise hospitality? Now, you all have heard me preach on hospitality. Are we supposed to? Are we supposed to have people into our homes? Are we supposed to serve the meals? Are we supposed to let them stay overnight if they need to? I mean, Paul had to rely on that over and over and over again. All the traveling missionaries. You know, missionaries have to rely on that today. You know, evangelists have to rely on that today. Pastors often have to rely on that today. Jason has received. Now let us tell you about how bad these guys are. These all. When somebody says these all, you know you're about to see a generalization. You know you're about to have something told you that whitewashes, or in this case, blackwashes everything whether it's true or not, it's like throwing the biggest bucket of mud that you can possibly think of. These all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Now, wait a minute. The decrees of Caesar. How many decrees of Caesar do you think there were? Three. Seven? Thousand? The decrees of Caesar go back generations of Caesars thousands of decrees of Caesar's. Do you think that anybody in his right mind who stopped and thought about that accusation would say, I think you're being a little overbroad here. Would you please list a few of the decrees of Caesar that these guys have broken? Well, they say, well, we got one anyway. And they sort of misquote it. They say, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now look. Pontius Pilate had already been through that. He had examined Jesus on that very subject. He said, you know, they're accusing you of saying that you're a king. And Jesus says, for this cause came I into the world. You know, that everyone who is of the truth hears me. And Jesus asked Pilate the question, he says, you say this thing of yourself or did others tell it about me to you? He said, what am I, a Jew? Your own people have accused you of this. And then, you know, after Pilate had that little brief discussion with Jesus, what did he do? He said, yep, you're sure guilty. You are really setting yourself up against Caesar. Is that what he said? No. He came out and said, I'm going to scourge him, and I'm going to let him go. I don't find any fault in him. You will discover that when people want to make an accusation against you, they will take something that you said or something that you believed, they will twist it out of proportion, they will apply it in a way that it is that you never applied it or intended it to be applied, and then they will make the accusation against you. Because they know that if they try to stick you for being a good person, <laughs> for, for living a Christian life, for living in holiness and honesty and moral purity and uprightness, they'll get laughed out of court. 
When you get accused, expect the accusations to be something like this. By saying that, what happened? Verse 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, ah, the brethren who were there at Jason's house had to pay some money too. They let them go. Now let's go back through the text a little more carefully. Verse 4 reminds us again that there were three groups of people who responded in one way or another. Some of the Jewish men in the synagogue, the Baal Greeks, called God-fearers in other parts of Acts, who had been attracted by the Jewish religion, and three important and influential women. But in this case, it's not the chief women, as back in Acts 13, who were moved to oppose Paul, but unbelieving Jewish men. Remember what it said back in Acts 13, Acts 13, 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. In this passage, in Acts 17, it's the honorable women who are the ones who believed. But in Acts 13, it was the honorable women who got stirred up. In this passage, they hired a bunch of hoodlums. But in Acts 13, they were able to get the honorable women against Paul. But here the honorable women have already become Christians. They're not going to be against Paul. Interesting how different situations in life, you think that you've got it under control, and you're dealing with the same, say, social class of people, and they respond in totally opposite manners. That's the difference between Acts 13 and Acts chapter 17 here. I think there's an important principle that we can deduce from that. Social classes of people do not always respond the same. You know, we're always looking for the rich people to come to this church. We're always looking for the influential people to come to this church. We're always looking for the people who have something that we need to come to this church. Now you can't play that up all the time because it's the rich men who take you to court. It's the rich men who sue you. But not all. You say, well, maybe we should go to the down and outers. But you know, they're different groups of down and outers. Some of them respond magnificently to the gospel. And others will just suck every cent you've got until you're dry and then spit out the bones. It's not the social class of people that determines receptivity to the gospel. We'll see what it is in just a second here. We find honorable women at Philippi, the wealthy ladies of Lydia's prayer group who had responded. And here's the key difference. There's one phrase that gives us the key difference. We find it in Acts 16, 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, this is back in the previous chapter, of the city of Thyatira, and oh, I did an interesting study on that this week. We won't have time for it tonight of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. That's the key phrase. It's not social class, whether great or inferior. The real question is, whose heart the Lord opened. We need to remember our job is not to be successful. Our job is to be obedient. It is God who sovereignly opens hearts and God who sovereignly closes hearts. I hope that's a lesson that you picked up from what I preached when we were talking about the responses of Pharaoh to Moses. Approximately half of the time when it speaks of Pharaoh's heart, the Bible says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And approximately half of the times when it talks about Pharaoh's heart, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Not God hardened his heart, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. Those are the two things that are set in juxtaposition, one against another as you look at Pharaoh's heart. From that first phrase, Pharaoh hardened his heart, we learn that all men are individually accountable. What we learn from the second phrase is that God is absolutely sovereign. God hardened Pharaoh's heart individual accountability, sovereignty of God. We can't put that together in our minds, but you've got to have both of them because the scripture teaches both of them. It's like 
two railroad tracks running side by side. And as you look way, way, way down in the distance, it appears that they come together. But no matter how far you walk down the tracks, they will still be there, both of them, side by side, same distance apart, and you need both of them to make the train run. That's what we see here. The sovereignty of God, the accountability of men. He is absolutely sovereign as to who will repent, who will believe, who will be saved. Paul states that theologically in Romans chapter 9 concerning Pharaoh, who I just gave as an illustration. Romans chapter 9, but it's obviously clear when we read the different responses of the different groups here of the honorable women. Some respond properly and some don't. Romans 9, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Who's making the choice there? Man or God? Everybody who thinks it's God who's making the choice, raise your hand. Everybody who thinks it's man who's making the choice, raise your hand. Well, I had three hands raised out of this entire group. Uh, how many of you are totally uncertain even what I'm preaching about tonight? <laughs> Everybody's hand goes up. Okay. <laughs> Folks, God makes the choice. That's what it said. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, that's the illustration I used just a second ago, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Did you know that when God caused that particular Pharaoh to be conceived with one precise element of the father and one precise element of the mother out of all the millions of possibilities that there could have been God had a purpose God said I'm gonna produce a Pharaoh that's gonna be born at exactly a certain time and be the Pharaoh at an exact certain date who will respond precisely the way that I want him to respond so that I get the greatest amount of glory that's what God says here. For this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Pharaoh, I'm going to make you in such a way that when you respond, you will be held accountable. But when you respond, it will be exactly the way I planned for it to be responsive. Because I'm going to glorify myself and I'm going to crush you like a worm. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now you know the world doesn't like that. The world likes to focus on, quote, our free will. The world likes to focus on, you know, uh, God's not really fair, is he? They always like to blame God. They don't blame themselves. They don't criticize their own sin. After all, that's their pet domain. They criticize God. And that's what Paul says here. He says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Now, you know, if somebody asks you that, who can resist the will of God? How would you answer them? Oh, everybody can resist the will of God. No, nobody can resist the will of God. We have an unstoppable object here. It's like a gigantic boulder weighing tons is rolling down the mountain, and here you are, a tiny little mouse about this side size and you say to the boulder stop you may not come any further what's the boulder gonna do you are dead mouse smushed mouse we are so much less than the mouse compared with the power of God himself nay but O man who art thou that rip repliest against God shall the thing formed say to him that formed it why hast thou made me thus hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump Imagine this. Here's a lump of clay. And you tie it, pull it in half. So you use half of it to do one thing and you use half of it to the other. Do you have a choice as to what you're going to use each of those two pieces for? You could switch the pieces if you wanted. You could let one of them just harden on its own, sitting on the floor. 
You could make both of them into beautiful vases. You could make both of them into spittoons. You could make one into a vase and you could make one into a spittoon. You have the right to do it because you're the potter with the clay. And that's what Paul says here. Hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction? They might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. God has the right to make that choice. God has the right to show mercy on whom he will show mercy. But you know, we can't blame God for our sins. James tells us that. James 1.13 Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Don't blame God. When you face temptation, don't blame God. When you are seduced by temptation, don't blame God. He tells you in verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. We make that mistake so often because we blame God for the bad things that happen. Then in verse 5 down here in our text, Acts 17, 5, we find the motive for the riot stated. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. The Jews which believed not moved with envy. Now, uh, hopefully you remember that this is one of the false motives that should never characterize a Christian. You recall that we studied envy when we studied false motives and the seven deadly sins as part of our study dealing with how to know the will of God. Envy is one of the works of the flesh. Look at the company that it keeps and the end result of those who commit the sin of envy. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now, here's the company that envy keeps. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, strife, seditions, heresies. Ah, here we come to it, verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Because that's not even a complete list of sins that it keeps company with. Of which, ah, uh, listen to this of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past. Now remember, this is in that list, envying's in the list, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now is Paul just trying to scare us, or is he telling us the truth? Is he just wildly gesticulating and making an off-the-wall statement that has no, no connection to reality? When he says, those who envy shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, he's listing it with adultery. He's listing it with fornication. He's listing it with murder. He's listing it with idolatry. He's listing it with witchcraft. You see, it's fairly significant what the Jews are doing here in Acts chapter 17, verse 5. The Jews which believed not were moved with envy. People who are not among God's elect and who do not respond to the gospel of Christ but who understand it and understand where it's going and what it's going to do are going to be motivated by all kinds of different things to stop you from spreading it. You see, envy never stops with an internal feeling. It always manifests itself in destructive action. That's true in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it's no small matter that envy is specifically stated here in our text for what happened next. By the way, I hope you remember the difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy wants what another person has. 
Envy motivates you to destroy what the other person has if you can't get it for yourself. They were moved with envy. They saw the crowds. They saw people leaving them and going to follow Paul. They saw that not only other Jewish men, but a gigantic number of Gentiles, and they were deadly opposed to Gentiles. And they saw the honorable women. Oh, there go the, the influences. There go the necks that turn the head. Those are, those are important people. Some of them have a lot of money. We can't tolerate that. The source of the problem is Paul. Let's go hire some thugs. We'll get rid of Paul. And that's what they did. Final destruction, though, of someone who envies is the person who has the envy. Job 5.2 For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. You know, if you commit the sin of envy, you're not hurting other people. Oh, you are hurting them somewhat. But in the end, you're killing yourself. That's what it says. And Proverbs 3.31, Envy thou not the oppressor, choose none of his ways. Why? He tells you, because envy will affect your health. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. What a difference. How do you want it to affect your health? How many of you are concerned about your health? How many of you focus on your health? We're all, yeah, everybody raised their hand on that one. We're all interested in our health, aren't we? You know, and we take vitamins and minerals and we sleep right and some of us sleep too long and and we, some of us exercise, you know, we walk or do something. I, as I said this morning, I get my exercise on Sunday when I have to run all the way up to the balcony and turn the thing on and then run all the way down the stairs and then all the way up to the sound room and turn that other machine on and then roll the way back down here and still try to get here before you finish the hymn and I'm huffing and puffing and breathing like crazy. We all do something, don't we? We're concerned about our physical health. Did you know that God has some principles in his word concerning your physical health? and things that will destroy your health and one of them is envy it says so right there did you know that envy is a worse evil motive for action than anger you know we talk about people doing things out of spite envy is doing something out of spite rather than doing it out of anger you don't just say I'm mad so I'm gonna get even well sometimes you're moved to get even but a lot of times, the motivation for doing something bad to the other person, doing something spiteful, is envy. I'll fix them. I'll crumble their cookies. Did you know that it won't last? That envy will die with you? It's talking about the wickedness. It says, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. All those things that you are envious of, all those things that you decided you're going to make it hard for another person, you're going to destroy their joy, their happiness, their success, because you couldn't have it for yourself. You know what? It's going to die with you. It's going to die with you. These Jews aren't paying attention to that. These people who were opposing the Apostle Paul were trying to mess up his life because they were envious. They couldn't have it for themselves, so they're going to destroy it so he can't have it. Perhaps the worst illustration in all of Scripture of envy is what the Sanhedrin did to Jesus. Matthew chapter 27, verse 18. Pilate here is thinking about what's been going on, and it says, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Mark says the same thing. When God says something twice, it's there for a reason. Mark 15.10 For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. You see, Jesus threatened their power base. Jesus was having an impact on people. Jesus was changing lives. Jesus was telling people things that no longer kept them under the thumb of the Sanhedrin. So they said, we've got to get rid of this guy. They plotted to destroy him. They hired a thug to do it. One of his own disciples, Judas, they gave him money 
to make sure that they could get Jesus. You know, someday someone may betray you. It's quite possible. I anticipated at some point in my life, it's happened uh, on minor occasions in different ways to me, but I, I suspect that if things continue as they are, that there will be some betrayals that cost some Christians their lives. Possibly me. I don't look forward to that. <laughs> Though I do look forward to heaven, however God decides to take me there. But there will be days that are coming when parents deliver their children to death, when children betray their parents to death. Jesus said so. For envy. That's why the Sanhedrin turned him over to Pilate. We saw lots of illustrations in the past, like from the life of Joseph. The patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Acts 7-9. Those Jews who opposed uh, the Apostle Paul, we've seen a couple of instances of that tonight. We find it listed with the great sins by Paul in the book of Romans, not just in that list that we read a moment ago. He speaks of the unregenerate being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. The only one in that list that has the term full of in front of it. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. We find envy in the church at Philippi of all things in Philippians 1.15 Philippi where he had such a good response with Lydia and the ladies at the, the home Bible study we find it in church leadership where Paul speaks of those who are proud knowing nothing doting about questions strifes of words where have cometh envy strife railings evil surmisings it's foolish to envy because God is in control David tells us that in Psalm 37 Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither by thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Folks, God is going to take care of the wicked. You don't have to be the one who says, well, I'm going to be God's instrument, and I'm going to throw some, some tax down in front of their way. This guy at work has been giving me grief. This guy at work is not a believer. This guy at work has rejected every track that I've ever tried to give him. So I'll fix him good. I'll make a bad report of him to the boss. He got promoted. I think I should have gotten promoted. We'll see about that. Be careful. Scripture commands you not to be envious at the wicked. Because what's the end of the envious man? It's death. And envy dies with the wicked. And envy is the practice of fools. Envy can occur in families. When Rachel saw she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I'd die. Of course, his envy was going on with Joseph and his brothers too. The brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Envy can occur among those who want religious leadership. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of God. Envy can occur in the workplace. Also, I consider it all to avail in every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Envy can occur in the spiritual realms. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. And here in our text tonight, Envy can cost other people money on your behalf, as well as a lot of false accusations. The Jews, which believed not, moved with envy. And when push came to shove, what does it say? Verses 8 and 9. They troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other. That is, they took their money. They had to pay a security deposit. They let them go. And it was false charges. But they still had to pay the security deposit to make sure that nothing bad happened. Because here were a bunch of mad people. Not very good justice system there. Now back to our initial question. Why were these unbelieving Jews envious? Answer because of the power of the gospel. Paul was making an impact that encroached upon what they considered to be their turf. Now we have to ask one more question. 
is what we're doing and the way that we're presenting the gospel making any kind of an impact? Are there people who are getting mad because of what we're doing? You know, it's like most of us prefer that old saying, you know, don't go away mad, just go away. <laughs> Folks, when you're preaching the truth, when you're sharing with your neighbor the truth, when you're handing a tract to a co-worker or talking to your boss about how he needs to be saved, either they're going to respond like some of the folks responded to Paul by trusting Christ and being saved or you know what they're gonna get mad someone who is along your same level may get envious and try to get other people to do harm to you or do harm to you himself if nothing is happening in your life there may be a problem with how or how not you are presenting the gospel. Now, all the trouble that comes to us is not because we're holy and righteous. A lot of it is because we're stupid and sinful. But there should be at least some response to the gospel as it's manifested through our lives and through our speech as we share Christ with other people. Could it be said of us that we are turning the world upside down. Oh, from their perspective, it's upside down. Uh, from God's perspective, they're the ones who've been hanging upside down, and suddenly you put them right side up, and they don't like that. It's like bats that hang from their feet from the caves, you know, with their heads down. And you turn them right side up, and they want to go back the other way. But can it be said of us that we are turning the world upside down. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who took our upside-down world and turned it right side up, and that in your mercy and grace you caused us to see that with joy and to be thankful for it. And you've commissioned us with the gospel of Christ, the word to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to be his witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And as we look at the book of Acts, it tells us how people will respond. It's not an issue of their social class. It's an issue of the ones whom the Lord opens their hearts. And we can't tell in advance who those will be. We would always like to be in the success story category, but as we see with Paul, certainly most zealous witness in the book of Acts. Not everybody responded to exactly the same message, even in the same social class, that other people in that class did. Sometimes it was wonderful revival. Sometimes it was terrifying persecution. Father, help us to remember we've not been called to be successful. We've only been called to be obedient. And then help us to obey in a way that brings glory to Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.